Your book's about nuclear nightmares. What's your worst nuclear nightmare? A nuclear terrorist attack, a nuclear 9-11. And that's not just mine. That's the number one threat to the United States, according to the national security strategy of the United States. We don't read about this kind of stuff much. We read about we these other conflicts that are going on, and they're awful and they're terrible, but they pale in comparison to what would happen if a nuclear bomb went off in an American city. That would change our history. That would fundamentally alter our economy, our politics. You could take the Bill of Rights and put it up on the shelf, and you might never see it again, not because some president was using it as an excuse to become a dictator. People would be demanding search and seizure like you've never seen in this country to make sure it didn't happen again. So that's why, even though there's a low risk of that, there's a huge, high consequence. So what is your most likely nuclear? Not the worst, but the most likely. I think we're most likely to see a conflict in South Asia. Yeah, Pakistan and India, both with nuclear weapons. These, these countries have fought four wars since they became independent at the end of World War II. There are radical elements in both societies that want a war. And the danger, and they now have nuclear weapons that are starting to be integrated into their defensive doctrines. So the risk is that another war will start, and I got to tell you, right now that looks inevitable. It's a question of when that war is going to happen. And as the, it escalates out of control, there's a, a shot is exchanged, a nuclear weapon is launched, and then the, flirt, the, the, the volley goes off. And then two, three terrible things happen. One, South Asia has a nuclear war. That's awful hundreds of millions would die. Two, there's a climate change effect. Scientists now calculate if just 100 nuclear weapons went off in South Asia, it would put enough smoke and particulates in the air to cover the Earth in a cloud for two or three years, dropping global temperatures by two or three degrees that would kill most food crops in the world. Mm -hmm. There'd be a worldwide famine that scientists estimate could kill a billion people. So you really have to worry about what's happening in South Asia. It seems far away, it seems distant, but it's a global catastrophe mm. should it occur. So what can we do to avoid a, a war in South Asia? You can't go around the world playing nuclear whack-a-mole. Let's stop North Korea, let's stop Iran, let's stop Pakistan. It doesn't work that way. And so when I wrote Nuclear Nightmares, that's what I was trying to do in a very thin volume explain the complexity of it and how the pieces fit together. You've got to take down the U.S. and Russian arsenals. Why? Because unless you take down the U.S. and Russian weapons, China's never going to reduce theirs. And if China won't reduce, then India won't reduce. And if India won't reduce, Pakistan won't reduce. You've also got to un address the underlying dynamics that are giving rise to the desire for nuclear weapons in those countries. So you've got to be, be involved with, with India and Pakistan to solve the problem over Kashmir. You've got to have an economic frame on this. Why is there so much fundamentalist uh, sentiment in Pakistan? Because the, the economy is collapsing. 50% of the, the males are, are unemployed. How can you give them alternative futures? So you, once you start to look at this, addressing global arsenals, regional conflicts, economic motivators, you realize you have to have a comprehensive approach in order to solve any of these problems. We are real close to a deal with Iran that would stop that program and roll it back and put it in a box and put a camera on it so that we could watch what Iran is doing. It's not a perfect solution, but it's a real good step forward. It's much better than what we have now. And it, we, we're near that point because back in November, the world powers, including the United States, negotiated a deal with Iran to, Iran to freeze the program. But that was a short-term deal. It expires July 20th, and we're supposed to have a final deal by then. We're real close, but there are some big gaps still remaining. It's quite possible that there'll be an extension of the negotiations to keep it going. We could, as, Mr., as President Rouhani says, learn to manage our differences the way we've managed them with adversaries in the past so they don't get out of control and where we might cooperate on certain areas. You want to stabilize Afghanistan? You need Iran. You want to stabilize Iraq? You need Iran. You want to prevent al-Qaeda from establishing a base in Syria? You need Iran. So our strategic interests overlap in certain key areas. And so we could, this could, nuclear deal could be the start of other areas of cooperation, and that is precisely what worries the Saudis, 
the Sunnis who are opposed to this, this Persian Shia state and worries the Israelis. So you would say it's pretty likely we will get a deal, maybe not on July 20th, but soon. I think the strategic imperatives are driving both countries towards a deal, and all the parties in negotiations. Russia want, doesn't want a nuclear Iran. China doesn't want a nuclear Iran. The UK and France and Germany, they don't want a nuclear Iran. It's all driving towards that. There are hardline elements in both countries that don't want a deal, that, that profit from the conflict, but I think those can be overcome. It'll be a battle, but I think we're going to get a deal. So let's talk about a couple of local issues. You mentioned um, that we have ICBMs in Colorado. There's um, a, a squadron that, that's based in, in Colorado. What, I mean, what does that mean to Coloradans? You've got to be a real optimist to think that you can keep thousands of these nuclear weapons around in fallible human hands and something terrible is not going to happen. And you see what's happening with the morale of our ICBM forces. We keep some of our best young officers stuck in holes under the prairie for 24, 36 hour shifts, training them to push a button they know they're never gonna push. And if they did push it, they'd be condemning millions of innocent civilians to a horrible death. What kind of job is that? Mm. No wonder there's morale problems. Mistakes can be made. Uh, switches can be flipped. Short circuits can happen, and if it happens, you could see a nuclear weapon accident in the, in, the, in the United States that nobody intends, that people say is impossible, but that could happen. Well, let's talk about Rocky Flats, too. Um, a lot of uh, local energy has gone into getting that yeah. operation not just shut down, but cleaned up. Rocky Flats has been a le real lesson to other states. They see what's happened. So you welcome the facility when it comes in, its jobs, its money, its prestige. You're helping the national security. Those are all real motivations. And then you find out that this is poisoning your environment and the money's not there to prevent that from happening. And you're stuck with the cleanup costs. And you have to go through protracted bureaucratic and legal battles just to, for the government to fulfill what you thought was the obligation they were committed to, which is restoring the land to its original, its original state. And there still are problems in Rocky Flats. There's huge problems up at Hanford, outside Seattle and Washington, you know, bulging tanks of liquid radioactive waste that are leaking into the aquifers. So we see these problems around. The cost of nuclear weapons is not just what's in the DOD budget, it's the decades of environmental damage that's done afterwards. So be careful what you wish for. Mm. It, it may be a lot more expensive than you think. And finally, the waste. And this is, gets, gets us back to Rocky Flat. We don't know what to do with this stuff. Mm. This, this lasts for thousands of years and we have no place to put it. So in all the 100 reactors that we have in this country, the waste is piling up outside the reactors with no plan in sight for how to get rid of it. Do you feel that you're making progress in, in educating the public and in persuading the public that this is an issue that they should feel uh, urgent about? I think about this all the time. And I'm probably one of the most optimistic people you will ever meet because I see what's happened. I see which way they're going. I see the threats, I see the nightmares, but I also see the solutions. And that's what I want to talk about, that this is something you can do something about. I know you didn't wake up this morning thinking about nuclear weapons, but, and I don't expect you to, but you know, I want you to think about it enough so that you realize there are solutions out there that they require new ways of thinking, new political leaders who will take the risks to change our policies, and if we do that, there's a huge benefit. And, that, and, and this is happening in the world. Most of the countries in the world don't have nuclear weapons. There used to be 23 countries that had nuclear weapons programs. We're down to two right now who are knocking on the nuclear door. Nuclear weapons haven't been used in 69 years since we used them last. People see that they don't have much military value and the weapons arsenals in the world have been slashed. So I see we're going in the, in the right direction, but like, 
people fleeing a forest fire, it's not just a question of direction, it's a question of speed. Mm -hmm. Can we get there fast enough? Mm -hmm. And so what I want to do is to urge everybody to move just a little bit faster. Well, I think that's a good place to end. Thank you very much for being with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on.